Entitled mother Karen demands I pay my stepdad's property tax bill with an update. This is a long one and a pretty terrible situation, so hope you can share some of my anger. The cast is stepdad, Karen mom, and me, at the time a 21 female, now 22 female. So last year, stepdad was selling his flat in London. It was as empty as the renter had left, so stepdad and narcissist Karen mom asked if I wanted to move in. I would benefit as it would be rent free and I was planning on moving to London soon so I'd be able to find a permanent place while living there. They would benefit as stepdad was struggling to sell the flat without it being staged so wanted me to live there to stage it, keep it clean and nice for viewings. It was great for both parties and I would only have to pay bills. In the UK, when you take over property tax, you have to register online and then wait for a letter giving you an account number where you can pay. While there, I registered but never managed to set up my account as I moved out after only six weeks when I found my own place and never got a letter during that time. So I called the council and they confirmed that if I never received a letter that I wouldn't be liable for the council tax as I would be living in another property and I was not the owner of the flat in the first place. I was a full-time student at the time so I was exempt from paying property tax. Karen and stepdad asked me to lie and say that I lived there up until the flat was sold because they wanted to use my exemption. I said that I didn't want to, but I eventually agreed. But still, I had never received the letter I needed, so I was not able to apply my student exemption. This all happened at the beginning of last year, and last month I got a letter to my new address from a debt collection company saying that a few days later, bailiffs would be coming to my property to seize my belongings to cover my debt. I was in a state of shock, trying to understand what debt I owed, when I realized it was the property tax bill at stepdad's flat from the year before. I phoned them up, I cried on the phone, and I told them that there was a misunderstanding that I would sort out with the council. They deferred the bailiff's date for a month so I could sort out the misunderstanding with the council. I called the council and they told me that they would sort it out, I just needed a letter from my university confirming I was a student. So I called up my university and I emailed them, but due to it being spring break, no one could help for a few weeks. That was fine, but this morning I started panicking, realizing it was only a week and a bit until the bailiffs would come. The council said that I could pay the amount, £460, and then get a refund once my student exemption came through. However, I'm a recent graduate, I'm working full time since October, but I'm still paying off my credit cards and overdraft from my time at university, so that I don't have a spare £460 just lying around. The only way I could pay it is by putting it on a credit card. I decided to bite the bullet and tell stepdad about the bailiffs, the council tax, and ask if he could pay the fee, and then I would make sure the refund was issued quickly. He has a good job, earning £92,000 per year, and recently sold his rental flat in London, the one I was staying at, so I thought he wouldn't mind helping out while I get the situation sorted. I then got a phone call from Karen Mom. It was a very long call, but I will write your key points and my responses. She said, How can you think that we are responsible for paying property tax when you were living there? I tried to set up an account, I replied, but never got the letter that I needed, so the council told me that I wasn't liable. I was only there for six weeks. But you should have tried harder to set it up so me and stepdad could get your student exemption. I never heard anything else back from them, so I couldn't apply my student exemption. Why should me and stepdad pay? I can't afford it right now, but I'll make sure to call tomorrow and hurry the refund along. Can't your partner pay? He is as liable as you because the bailiffs would come to your house and take your shared things. Me and my partner live together. He literally has nothing to do with the situation. I hadn't even met him when I was living at stepdad's flat. Me and stepdad were doing you a huge favor by letting you stay there for free. And this is how you repay us? It was mutually beneficial. I took time out of my studies to clean the flat, stage it for viewings, and helped you sell the flat while I got to live there for free. Well, I can't afford it, and neither can stepdad. In silence, I wanted to make the point that this is a lie. She recently started working full-time for the first time in 27 years. She gets maintenance from my dad, her ex-husband, and she also rents out a five-bedroom house that she owns outright, so she has income from that. Also, stepdad has a 92000 a year job and just sold his flat in London. There was a lot more to the conversation, with a lot of emotional manipulation, but I stood my ground. Mom paid the fee and said I had to get a refund ASAP, so I agreed. 
The thing that hurts the most is that I'm in a horrific situation with bailiffs about to turn up at my door. I now have a record as the council took me to court without ever notifying me. The letter telling me bailiffs were coming was the first I received and my credit score will take a massive hit. If I don't pay, I can literally be sent to prison. It's rare but possible. All for 460 pounds that she and stepdad can afford that will get refunded. I was planning on keeping up the lie that Karen mom and stepdad asked and applying my student exemption to the time that stepdad sold the flat, which was an extra two months after I left. But now, I honestly want to just have the bailiff send it to the mom and stepdad's house, as it is technically all his liability. This is a very fresh situation, and I'm honestly just in shock. Karen mom is usually manipulative, but this is another level. She would rather I have a court record, possibly go to prison, take a hit to my credit score, and take out a credit card to pay the fee, than get stepdad to pay for something that he was liable for. I'm going to call the council in the morning and explain everything, including that Karen mom and stepdad have been trying to get me to commit fraud. I looked through old messages from mom and found one saying, stepdad had asked if you continue to pay council tax until the flat has sold so it's free, with me not responding to this. I've taken screenshots of as much evidence as I can, and I'm going to be selfish and cover my own butt for once instead of protecting her. Since I posted, Karen Mom has also asked me to send her as much as I could afford to cover the fee, so I gave her a thumbs up and sent nothing. I was going to use my student exemption for the six weeks that I was living there, but after everyone's advice and some research, I'm not going to do this anymore, and will be saying that stepdad is responsible for it all. Final update. I didn't expect to have to write a whole separate post, holy crap, as an update, but so much has happened it could be a post of its own. The last thing I talked about on my original post was the phone call with my entitled Karen mom on Monday, where she still wanted me to commit fraud for stepdad by lying about being in his flat for longer, so he didn't have to pay council tax, as I had a student exemption. She agreed to pay it, but only if she got a full refund, meaning she wanted me to lie to the council. One small thing that some people misinterpreted in my last post. Karen mom and stepdad asked me multiple times to commit fraud, but I never agreed to. I never actually committed fraud for them, but they expected me to. Also, from this unpaid bill that I didn't know about, I got a CCJ, County Court Judgment, which will stay on my record and affect my credit score. Anyway, this is what happened next. I'll be removing personal details from messages, but other than that, they're identical to the original. Messages with entitled Karen mom on Tuesday. I said, I am contacting the council now to try and get a refund, but I'll be telling them that I moved out on this date because I did. My exemption will only be applied for the period that I was there, meaning that you guys will still have a bit of the bill that won't be refunded. Karen mom says, leave it as is, it's paid. She basically doesn't want me to talk to the council because if I do, they'll know that stepdad committed fraud by not declaring that he was the occupier and that Karen mom and stepdad tried to make me commit fraud too. No, you wanted the refund. I will get my part refunded. I refused to have a court record and poor credit score when stepdad was responsible for the last month and a half of council tax payments. It's paid. Don't make it more complicated. Don't call the council until you talk to me. After I moved out, stepdad should have told the council that he was the owner of the property and that it was empty. You've already screwed it up. Don't make it any worse. How did I screw it up? By not sorting it out sooner. Why would I make it any worse? I need to protect myself from a lifetime of poor credit score and having a court record. I don't understand what the problem is. In one scenario, the bill won't get anything refunded and you won't benefit. In the other scenario, a large portion of the bill is refunded and your daughter won't have a poor credit score and a court record for the rest of her life. Why are you choosing the first scenario? You're a selfish, ungrateful child. What date are you telling them that you moved out? You really want me to have a crappy credit score and a court record for no good reason? Why? I don't understand. It's not like that's much of a hassle. Just cover the cost after when you moved out. It's a month and a half extra. I don't want that. She's responding to the first bit of my last message here. That's why I paid 460 pounds just to sort out your screw ups. Stepdad would have to fill in a little form. Meanwhile, I would be screwed for the rest of my life. Just tell me why that is what you care about. You care more about that stepdad might be slightly inconvenienced than me having a court record. You are being so difficult. The small portion between when you moved out and the flat sold has nothing to do with the CCJ. It does. The dates were listed on the CCJ. The bill was still unpaid. If I don't, I will have a freaking record. Do you not understand that? Who are you protecting? 
Why the heck are you throwing your daughter under the bridge, letting her get a permanent record, when stepdad would literally have to fill out a form? What the heck happened to blood is thicker than water? This isn't your problem to fix, it's stepdad's. Why isn't he dealing with his own crap? She ignored me for two hours and then said, You aren't pleasant. If you had told the council that you had moved out and given a forwarding address, this wouldn't be an issue. You brought this on yourself. I wish I hadn't paid the bill. Stepdad has now contacted the council and taken responsibility from the time you moved out until the time the flat sold. Yeah, I laughed at this. She realized that if she didn't come forward before I did, then stepdad would be in a lot of crap for committing fraud. When you moved into the flat, you agreed to pay for the council tax and towards the gas and electric. I cannot believe how ungrateful you have been and how you're trying to blame stepdad for the fact that you didn't sort out the council tax bill when you agreed to. What's your plan for repaying this 460 pound bill? Will you get the full 460 pound back from the council? I'll get my part back. I emailed the council with all the information of events, proof of when I moved out and so on. I'll let you know what they say. Between these messages, she called and texted my dad, who backed me up and said it was stepdad and her responsibility. For some reason, she's now pretending like nothing happened. Now the bill has been paid. I hope it makes you feel better. Let me know what the council says. This whole exchange happened over an entire day. Between this, she called me seven times. I only picked up the phone twice. The first time, she was in the car with my 11-year-old brother sat next to her. Thankfully, I actually recorded these calls, so I'll write them out below. The first call. She says, hello, can you hear me? I say, hi, yeah. Um, the problem is, what period is it from and to? So I'm being charged from the date I moved in to the date the flat sold. Yep, that's fine. It's been paid for that. That's fine. I've paid it. It's done. Yeah, but just because it's been paid, like I'm going to have a court record and a crap credit score. Yeah, well, you should have thought about that before you ignored the letter. I didn't get a letter. That's the whole point. Yes, but you did have a letter on the date a few weeks ago, didn't you? Yeah, but that was from the bailiffs, and I sorted it out as soon as I could. What, yesterday? I sorted it out, I put a hold on my account, I was getting an exemption letter from my university, and then suddenly I realized that the time period I was being charged for was beyond when I was actually living there. But it doesn't matter, as long as it's paid, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that it extended on longer, you're just making it more complicated. Why is it making it more complicated? Because at the end of the day, were you paying tax in the place you moved to? Yes, I was. You were on a group council tax and you never paid council tax after you moved out. After I moved out, I moved into a shared house where we split the council tax between all of us and I paid monthly for this. I'm silent because this is not at all true and she knows that. Why? She interrupts. No, so I'm asking you. It's been paid until the end of the term if you start because it's been such a long time. I recall our conversations before that you were just going to carry on paying it after the term that you were there. There is no point telling them that you moved out two weeks sooner. That will not resolve the problem. I moved out a month and a half sooner. No, no, no. I don't think it was quite that. It doesn't matter. When the flat sold, just keep it as is with those dates. Otherwise, it's going to make it more complicated because then we'll have to get back involved with the council ourselves. Just let them charge you for that period. Why? She interrupts and keeps talking over me. Wait, listen, listen. You're making it more complicated than it is. Why didn't stepdad just tell them that he was the one that owned the flat for that period? She's shouting now. Because it's gone on for so long, it should have been sorted out after you left. As far as I recall, you were going to pay the council tax up until the flat sold anyway. Again, I never agreed to this. I found screenshots of her asking multiple times and me ignoring and then refusing. No, I never said I would do that. Silence. Hello? Pause. So what are you going to do then, she says. You're going to drop us in the crap? You're going to, you know, you already asked me to pay it. I paid your screwy bill. What are you going to do now? So you want me to cover the period between when you moved out and when the flat sold. Is that what you're saying? It'll be the same payment for you. It's just that I don't, I shockingly don't want to have a court record. Well, I shockingly would have made sure that I paid my council tax bill so I wouldn't get one. But as far as I knew, I sorted it out. No, you didn't. You should have chased it up. You knew you had to pay it because that's why you got a CCJ. This is the thing. You said to me yesterday that, she's shouting again, before contacting the council, you want to tell them the date you moved out and you want me to now sort it out with the council and pay from the date that you moved out to the date the flat sold. Is that correct? What is wrong with you telling them the truth? 
After a pause, I'll screw off and hangs up. The second phone call. Hello, she says. Hello? I'm furious with you. Why are you doing this to me? What am I doing to you? You said that you would cover the bill while the flat was where it was. I didn't. And now you're going to drop me and stepdad in it. You did. That was part of it. We offered you to stay in a free flat. We told you that you had to cover the bills. So you wanted me to cover the bills for when I was not living there? Long pause. Oh, don't be like this. I paid the freaking bill. What is the matter? So that's what you're saying. You wanted me to cover it. I've paid the bill already. I've paid the bill. So why are you now doing what you're doing to me? Listen, listen, I'm not doing it to you. Don't listen, listen me in a patronizing tone. You are. You are doing it to me and stepdad. That is what you're doing. I'm not. Yes, you are. That's what you're doing. I'm not doing. She interrupts me saying, you're burning your bridges. Do you know what I'm actually thinking of doing right now is ringing up the bank and canceling the payment that I've made. And I'm going to say that you made a fraudulent payment because that's how you're making me feel by the way you're treating me and the way you're behaving. Would you like me to do that? You can't threaten me anymore, so that's fine. I can, because you're threatening me. You're telling me that I'm responsible for the payments between when you moved out and when the flat sold. That's what you are telling me. May I speak? This has no correlation. May I speak? She continues talking. May I speak? And hangs up. Between phone calls and messages, I called my dad to rant. About an hour after that, my mom actually contacted my dad to try and get his sympathy, but he already knew the situation from what I told him. Bear in mind, my parents have been divorced for eight years, and they don't talk regularly, only for childcare arrangements with my brother. My dad sent me the screenshots of a couple of the messages. They don't have the whole conversation, but key parts. The first screenshot says, She agreed to pay the bills in a free flat. She's so out of order. And dad says, And she believed that she'd done that. Unfortunately, the council tax process and its inefficiencies has screwed up here. I think they are in the wrong and need a remedy, but she has to clear her name, Karen, and to do that, she needs to give them accurate dates where she was responsible for the flat. As you've paid the outstanding amount in full, there should be no comeback on you or stepdad, but the CCJ issuance process is a butt and causes huge damage to innocent people like her. Screenshot 2. She was supposed to sort this out. I've paid the bill. Why does she have to make things difficult by saying she moved out early? She shouldn't have had to, Karen. She was a student. She was exempt. She explained to me what she did, and all seems correct. But unfortunately, she moved out, and before you know it, they've issued court proceedings due to lack of contact. Surely stepdad had to contact them when he took back control of the flat? I'm surprised they didn't ask him for the details of the person who was in the flat for that period. You really think she's the innocent one? Wake up, Dad. Screenshot 3. She's brought this all on herself. If she had told the council that she'd moved out and where she moved to, it wouldn't be an issue. Again, Dad replies, she told me that she did tell them she'd moved out. I can only take her word for that. There's no responsibility to tell them where she's moved to if it's a different council. Stepdad should also have told them that he was responsible when she did move out, though. So if he did that, then there shouldn't be an issue. She is in the wrong. She is blaming everyone else but her. Why are you so angry about it, Karen? It's sorted out now, isn't it? She just needs some support to clear her CCJ. My dad and I haven't always gotten along, but if there's one thing he can get behind, is my mother doing something wrong. He doesn't like her much. Also, I do trust his advice in this situation, as he is a financial advisor and got a CCJ by accident a few years ago, so he knows how to deal with it. One thing he pointed out was that her reaction was massively overboard. She is insanely angry. I think it's because stepdad already committed fraud by not telling the council that he was responsible for payments when I moved out. But my dad thinks there might be something more to it. Either way, Karen is not happy that the authorities are getting involved in her and stepdad's finances and taxes. As of now, there's a couple of things happening. I called the council and told them everything, including that Karen and stepdad tried to get me to commit fraud. I then sent a long email with a timeline of events and screenshots of messages where Karen asked me to commit fraud. They are now in charge of investigating that and hopefully it'll be sorted out and I can have my court record wiped. Karen asked my dad to have a talk with stepdad on Friday so I don't know what's going to happen there. I'm ignoring Karen mom for a while until it gets sorted out and honestly I think I might go no contact or very 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 low contact with her after this. There's one final update in a different piece that is entitled Dealing with a Narcissist Parent Who Is Dying. 
I, female 23, finally admitted to myself in therapy that I was abused as a child by my narcissistic parents. I went no contact with them eight months ago, and it's been the biggest relief. Recently, my Karen mom has been trying to get in touch with me again, firstly sending cryptic emails about how we need to find some common ground and fix things before it's too late. She's hinted at illness and surgery, but never outwardly said anything other than that she has an appointment. The emails were very manipulative, leaving out info so that I would reach back out to her. I didn't. An hour ago, I got a text from my stepdad, who I'm also no contact with. He told me that Karen mom is actually getting surgery in March, and she wants to reconcile before it's too late. Now I know that my mom has health problems, and although she's only 50, she was diagnosed with NF2 in her 30s. For those who don't know, NF2 is a genetic mutation causing tumors to grow randomly in the brain. She has had two tumors since her 30s, and they've not grown much. I always knew about her condition as I've had yearly MRIs to screen for it myself, and knew there was a possibility her tumors would grow. According to her, tumors grow during times of stress. The largest growth was when my dad left her, but she's now said that they've grown because of her stress around me. Initially, it was when I went to university, then when I moved out, and now since I am no contact. She's openly told me that I am responsible for the growth of her tumors. Around the time I went no contact, she went fully deaf in one ear and got hearing aids fitted. She's now having radio surgery in March to try and remove one of the tumors, but this is a risky operation. My stepdad's message said, Your mom would like to make meaningful contact with you before she goes in for this potentially life-changing procedure. I hope you can find it in your heart to contact her before it's too late. I know surgery is risky, but I don't think death is common. I feel like this is just a manipulation tactic, and I also feel guilty for not wanting to reach out to her. It's just very confusing. This is a tragically wild turn of events here that we find from the previous story about the property tax. Holy cow, what do you think? Entitled Neighbor, Part 1, posted by Ellen Gass. My parents, until recently, lived in the same house for 50 plus years. We had three neighbors on the north side over that time. The first was a little old woman we'll call Eleanor. She was a hermit, and as such, us young kids were always scared of her. She died when I was a freshman in high school. It took a few years, and then we had a new guy by the property named Richard. One day, we found him cutting down bushes on our property. The houses had about 10 feet between them. Our property line was 6 feet from our house, and he had 4 feet. The bushes were 1 foot into our property. Eleanor never had an issue with them. She was a nature lover. She never mowed her backyard. She only mowed the front. It was a push mower, non-power, at 6 a.m. My dad and I confronted him and let him know that those were our bushes that he was cutting down, and we were not happy about it. He didn't care. He needed to do it so that he could get his cars into his backyard. We said, you have a curb cut out on the other side of your house. You can mow it and have a straight access to the backyard as the original builder intended. He stormed off and the next day the bushes were all gone. We watched him drive his cars on our property to his backyard. Oh yeah, these were the cheap Porsches of the mid 1980s base model 944s. Then dad and I decided that we needed metal fence posts to mark the property line. We put them 5 inches on our side of the property line and drove them down really deep. There was very little room for him to get anything past them, especially his cars. When Richard got home, we could hear the yelling and cussing for quite a few hours. And then we heard a car start up in the back and he successfully got one of his cars out, but not with serious damage to the side, nice sized scrapes all along the side of the car. Our newly planted fence leaned in toward our property. I really wish at that time that we had stuff we have today. I'd really like to have a video of that. In any event, we contacted police about the damage of our property, our newly constructed fence, and they gave him a ticket. He tried to claim that we damaged his car and that the officer pointed out that he had no right to use our property unless we gave permission and it's obvious that we had not. He got the other car out not too long after. Same deal, scraped sides to all heck. This was just the beginning of the issues that we had with him. Now this is going to include the fence. Ultimately, we pulled out the metal fencing and put in treated wood fence posts. We sunk them four feet into the dirt and then used a wood lattice panel between them. 
All of this was up to city code at the time. We also extended the fence well into the front yard. Again, Richard was ticked. He began stacking concrete, rocks, and wood up against the fence, which is still five inches inside of our property line. Over time, it made the fence sag more into our yard, and he continued to pile it higher and higher, until one day, the fence broke. All of his crap fell into our yard. Dad wasn't home at the time, so I took it upon myself to relocate everything back into his yard. So one by one, it all ended up near his front porch. As I was getting close to being done, he steps out of his house as a nice sized rock happens to hurtle right by him. Well, this ticked Richard off. Cops were called and they arrived after I had finished relocating everything. When the cop came to interview me, I just pointed to the fence that was damaged. The weight of the crap that he kept putting up against the fence that was well within our property line caused it to fail, I said. I was just relocating the mess that spilled into our yard back into his. By this time, the cops had been out a few times and knew what was going on. They pointedly asked if he had caused the broken fence, and I said yes, I mean it was the truth. I explained what had happened. They dismissed my throwing a rock at him and wrote a citation for destruction of property. He was fuming when the cops left, and as he usually would do, he left for a couple of hours. Dad got home and I told him the story, and he had a good laugh. Now this was a fun one too. Richard acquired some signs that said, no parking by the order of the police, and put them out front of his house. At that time, I was driving an old four-cylinder Datsun pickup, green for those who need that, and I was parking out front of our house. The neighborhood, over the years, has moved from single family to students renting places. We live in a college town and we're an easy walking distance to the school. We had a lot of students parking on our street. So sometimes, my truck was parked out in front of our house or in front of his. With my sister now driving as well, it was just easier to park on the street instead of playing Tetris with cars. Anyway, a few days after the signs popped up, I noticed he was still parking his cars, with the scrape marks still on the side of the mall, out front. Okay, fair game. I parked out there as well. He called the cops, and the ticket lady came out and issued me a ticket. When I asked her why, she pointed at the signs. I asked if they were official and if he had the permit for them, and she checked, and no, in fact, he did not. Then the cop showed up. He was questioned why he needed the signs and how he acquired them. He pointed to his house. Let me get sidetracked for a moment. He had been working on renovating his house for two years at this point. The house was small, like efficiency apartment small one or two main rooms, a bathroom, and so on. I had been in the house on a few occasions when Eleanor was living there. He had this, uh, I don't know what to really call it, like, like a beam. It was meant to lift his roof while he did the internal work on the house. It extended 10 feet out front and back. This beam was constructed of repurposed wood, small pieces and large pieces, scraps of all kinds. It looked like a puzzle, and while it may have carried a load, it was not structurally sound. It was a local joke about what he was doing and how. Now It reminded me of the forts that we would build at a friend's house, where any piece of scrap wood was fair game and it could be made to work. Back to the story. He got two tickets from the cops and three from the city. One I overheard was for no permit. Now This one happened after most of the other stuff and near the end of his time there. I worked as a student operator in a computer lab. I had the late shift a number of nights of the week. It was good money for babysitting computers. Since it was a college campus, we had to park a fair distance away. One night, I looked up and happened to see Richard in the lab. I should also mention that by this time, we had a full family no contact order on him. I didn't think he was a student, but we got a lot of non-students in the lab since we had publicly accessible computers. No logins needed to use them. He was typing like it was going out of style. Then he got up and he left. We did have cameras at the entrances, so I saw him leave. I went over to his machine and I pulled the file from the trash that he'd been working on. I printed a copy out and I read it. It was about all the trouble that the neighbors were making. Hey, that's us and how he can't get anything done because we keep turning him in. Then the letter went legal. He was trying to write like it was a letter from a lawyer or something. 
I laughed it off. He didn't show up again that I recall when I was there. One night a few weeks after that, I signed out on my shift and I went home. It was after 1 a.m. I noticed him sitting in the parking lot in one of his cars smoking. Okay, I thought to myself, this is interesting. I hopped in my Datsun pickup and started it up and it was loud. My muffler had finally let go. I took off out of that lot, trying to not over ref to make it loud at 1 a.m. for anyone but me. I noticed that he took off at the same time and went the same direction. Okay, this is the way home, but I decided to test to see if he was following me, and yup. I took the most out of the way home, using main streets instead of the side streets, which would have been like 10 times quicker, only to have him keep on following. I went around the block close to the house to make sure that I wasn't dreaming this, and no. He followed me right to the house. I parked in the driveway this time, and he parked where he could in front of his house. I woke dad up, and then we called the cops. I told the cops that I was taking a long way home due to the muffler and not wanting to tick anyone off, but that I also did a loop around the block, and sure enough, he was following me. They arrested him for a no contact violation, and when I told them about the previous encounter the weeks before at work, they added a second charge. When it went to court, I wasn't the only one there to testify. They lumped another case of his in with it. Destruction of public property. After all that had happened, he no longer had a driver's license. He got ticked because he had to take public transportation. He got even more ticked when the driver wouldn't stop between two stops to let him out. He kicked the windows out of the bus. He went to jail for about three months. After that, he lost the house and his cars. We would see him from time to time walking all over town, banned from the bus, banned from his house, and his cars. Pastor's wife hops our fence, calls the cops on us, and maybe more, posted by Social Anxiety Kyle. My wife and our kids, all under age 10, went on vacation to Florida. While we are gone, I have my parents coming over twice a day to feed them, dogs, and give them water when they need it. The dogs are outside, but they have access to a large backyard and sunroom. They're living the life, basically. Also important to note that we live in a nice area. It's a decent house in a cul-de-sac in a small town in Indiana. I get a call from my neighbor, who is a pastor, and he tells me that our dogs have been barking at night and keeping our surrounding neighbors awake. He also said that it didn't look like our dogs had been getting fed or watered and that his wife went into our eight foot tall fence backyard to give the dogs water and food. He tells me that his wife told him this as he isn't home and he has been out of town for work while we were on vacation. So he's calling me to report what his wife told him. Thought it was kind of odd because his wife has my wife and I's phone numbers. I played it off that she didn't like confrontation. To me, it wasn't that much of a confrontation, but whatever. I also thought going in our backyard was a little much, but I'm friends with my pastor neighbor, so I just kind of brushed it off. So I tell my pastor neighbor, thanks for letting me know. I appreciate you having the stones to let me know. I don't want to be a bad neighbor. I'll have my parents put the dogs in the garage at night so they won't bark and that the dogs have been fed by my parents every day since we've been gone. And I thought that that was the end of it. Not even close. I get a call from my parents a few hours later when they came to our house to feed the dogs. They said they pulled up our mountain of a driveway, and as soon as they got out, my neighbor from directly across the street started screaming at them about how the dogs aren't being fed or watered. I still don't understand why they're saying this. If you went in our backyard, you'd see a plethora of food and water in the sunroom. When my parents started heading to the backyard, they thought they heard something. My dad creeps his head over the fence to see my neighbor, pastor's wife, in our backyard. He tells her to get out and threatens to call the police as she is trespassing. She leaves. Remember, this is all after my conversation with my pastor neighbor and after he reported what I said to his wife. My parents are in the backyard dealing with the dogs and notice that they called the police. My parents at this point are waiting for the officer to stop talking to the neighbors and come to my house. He finally does. 
the first thing the officer says to my parents is, you got some nosy butt neighbors. He explains what they said, and my mom invites him into my house and into my backyard to show him that the dogs are being taken care of. At first he declines, saying that he believes my parents, but eventually he came inside. My parents had a good conversation with him. He talked about how my family and I don't need to worry about this and that we should be having fun on vacation. He even opened up about his family and his little girl. This is nuts and I'm ticked at my neighbors for all this crap at this point. We finally come home from vacation and are home for three weeks and I still haven't seen my neighbors, which is odd. My neighbor to the left of us walks his dog frequently and I see him almost every day. I haven't seen him at all. So I text my pastor neighbor and I say, how's it going? Because he hasn't said anything to me since I figured out his wife hopped our fence again and that she called the police. So he has the idea for me and him to talk in person. So we start talking in my front yard and he starts telling me everything that happened. Once again, he wasn't home, so this is what he knows from his wife. He apologizes for his wife. Weird, why isn't his wife apologizing to us? And he tells me the same information that I've already shared, except three things. First off, his wife accidentally let the dogs out and she took them inside their house for a bit. They were back in our backyard before my parents got there and before we got back. Weird, but whatever, I guess. Then he mentions that he and his wife have a rule that she isn't allowed to drink unless he is home and that one of the days that we were gone, she had been drinking. This was news to me. And then he told me what the cop said to the group of neighbors that were speaking with the cop. He said it like this. I'm telling you this because you're my friend and there's no judgment here and you take it how you want. The cop said that when he went into your house, he had to hold his nose it smelled so bad. It was unsanitary and that the cop said this is a house they know about and used the term drug house to describe my home. I felt good about the conversation except that last part. So I questioned him on that again and I said, did the cop only say this to your wife or were there more neighbors? He told me that it was her and my neighbor to the left of me that heard this. Red flags are going off in my head as I walk back to my house. We have three young kids, so our house isn't super clean, but it's not too bad and it's definitely not unsanitary. Also, why would an officer leave my house after talking to my parents and say that about our house to our neighbors? An officer's job is to de-escalate the situation and this just didn't seem like something an officer would do or say. Not to mention, none of it is even remotely true. The next day, I get a text from my pastor neighbor saying, this. Kyle, thanks for your time yesterday. I appreciate friends being able to weigh into awkward issues. On another note, though the police officer did say the things I shared with you, it really wasn't germane to the conversation or issue at hand, Kyle. I didn't need to share those things. My apologies, bro. Now, I'm really questioning if the officer said this. This is a weird thing to even apologize for. Even if you think, ah, oh, I shouldn't have mentioned that part. Why would you take the time to apologize for it? I responded very honestly and said, Hey, I appreciate you willing to face confrontation. And no, I'm glad you shared with me what the police said. I don't believe they said that in the slightest amount for many reasons to be, well, completely honest. It may have been best for me to keep my opinion to myself, but I was still kind of ticked off. He replies, Hey Kyle, just to be clear, your text is saying that the police officer didn't say that, which means that you're saying my neighbor to the left and my wife misheard the officer, or worse, made that up. He tells me to question my neighbor to the left about it and to give him a call. I give my pastor neighbor a call, but he doesn't answer and never calls me back. So I text him saying that I plan to ask my left neighbor and I hope that this is all a misunderstanding. I also mentioned that if the officer did say that, then that would be defamation of character, so I want to know what was said. He replies, geez Kyle, what's your goal in all of this? I explained to him that this is not something I want spread around like it has, because I have three young kids. 
I don't want to have to deal with CPS or have my kids be bullied at school for a stinky house or have my reputation soiled over this false nonsense as my job involves me going to schools around the country and working with teens. He has never replied to this answer. A few days later, I meet up with my left neighbor in my front yard and I talk about everything. I specifically ask him if he was outside and talking to the officer when he left our house from talking to our parents. He said yes. I questioned him on what the officer said, and he said something similar to what my pastor neighbor said, but different enough to know that there is some shenanigans going on. He tells me that the officer told him that the house smelled like MJ when he walked in. He says that he didn't say drug house specifically, but he did say something about MJ. My left neighbor didn't seem to know exactly what was said and was vague about this all. He also said that the officer said our house was known well by the police department. So my wife and I are trying to figure out how we learn the truth because something fishy is going on here. She has a friend that is a cop in another county and he gives us some advice. First, he tells us that there is no way in heck the officer said that to our neighbors. Second, he tells us that we can call the sheriff's department and they will have that same officer give us a call. So, after three days of playing phone tag, we finally get in touch with this officer. We start telling him what the neighbors are saying about what he said and he cuts us off and starts laughing, saying that none of that was ever said. He says, I know what a drug house is and your house is not it at all. No one knows about your house and we don't have suspicion of anything at all never said it stunk or anything like that. All I said was that the dogs were taken care of and that the matter was resolved and then I left. The officer also mentioned that after leaving my house and talking to my parents, he only talked to the wife of my pastor neighbor. My wife and I are relieved now because we were able to confirm that the officer didn't actually say this, but now we are left with another problem. How the heck do we approach this from here? We are 100% for sure that our left neighbor and the wife of our pastor neighbor were lying and making crap up about my house and our family. I don't understand why though. I'm not sure about our pastor neighbor. I feel that he didn't know much and was just being honest the first time that I talked to him in the front yard. After the text messages the day after, I'm not sure if he learned that his wife lied about everything and is trying to hide it or if he is still clueless on the truth. All I know is that this is freaking nuts. It's been about a week since we've talked to the officer, but I'm not sure how to handle this from here. I'm not sweeping this under the rug. I want to confront them in some capacity and let them know that we know the truth. But it's a mess because I'm friends with my pastor neighbor, not so sure anymore, <laughs> and I'm not trying to throw a wrench in this guy's marriage, but his wife sputtering this crap about us for no reason is crazy. So here I am, asking for help on how to handle this appropriately as well as hear your theories. This comment suggests, time to tell the pastor, thanks for telling us your wife has a drinking problem, that explains the lies she's spreading. Would you like the phone number for the officer that was here? He will tell you what actually happened. Also, we'll be installing cameras, so warn your wife to stop trespassing. Neighbor's landlord gave someone permission to cut down my trees. Hey everyone, I am very upset over what went down today on my property without my consent. I own my property in upstate New York in a city, and the lot next to me has two duplexes on it. The duplex in the back of the lot is built right up along our property line and border, which is pretty normal. There have been multiple tenants there over the past few years that have thrown their trash out their windows into my backyard, but that's beside the point. This afternoon, I looked out my back window and saw a ladder set up in my yard to get to their roof and a decent chunk of trees gone from my yard. I immediately went outside to take pictures of everything and to call my partner. My yard is now also covered in nails and old shingles and a couple of my trees were trimmed where they crossed the property line, which I know is legal and fine, I don't care about those. But three of my trees were completely cut down to the stump and discarded also in my backyard. One of the roofers saw me take the pictures and came down to tell me that the owner of the property they were working on said to just cut away anything in their way. Pointed out that the trees were only three to four inches in diameter each, so not a big deal, and said that if I wanted, he would go to Home Depot and buy me new trees on the spot. 
I've never met the neighboring landlord and in no way gave him permission to come onto my property, let other people onto my property, or to cut down my trees. I got his contact information and spoke to him over the phone. He claimed that he had tried to talk to me but couldn't because I was never home. I have a full-time job and when I pointed out that he had no permission to cut my trees, he threatened to sue me because another tree that they had trimmed had allegedly caused damage to said roof. I was never notified or approached about that in the past. My backyard is very small, but part of the appeal for my partner and I is that it's very green and has a lot of trees and vines that keep it shaded, somewhat private and naturally beautiful in an otherwise overcrowded and gray area of the city, and now a chunk of that has been stripped away. I'm meeting with a family friend that works in local code enforcement tomorrow, but my parents think I should just let it go. Meanwhile, I'm just so upset and stressed and anxious about this, and I know tree law is kind of a big deal, so I was hoping someone here could let me know if there's something I can pursue, and if I should be worried about him countersuing for those supposed roof damages. Do you agree with this answer? The roofer offered to buy you new trees because he knows he is big time screwed. New York tree laws are nothing to laugh at. New York law allows for a penalty of three times the timber value, or $250, or both, for each tree removed without owner permission plus whatever city laws were broken. Consult a property attorney ASAP. Do you think lawyering up is the best thing to do here? Let me know. Our neighbors took our fence while we were on a road trip. So, we've had issues with our attached neighbors from the moment that we bought our house. Originally, it was just a 60-something female and her 18-something male grandson. The day we moved in, we tried to make small talk and introduced ourselves. The woman was dropping hints that the old owners used to bake her goodies all the time and she missed it, kind of insinuating that we should be like them because she deserved to be treated like a princess. The grandson introduced himself as the worst person in town, <laughs> what an intro. So afterwards, we just tried to keep a friendly distance and stay out of their way. Suddenly. After about a week of living here, they began screaming at odd hours, blasting music and banging on the walls. The police were at their house for domestic disputes monthly due to the woman calling the cops on her grandson. We've lived here for over two years now, fixing up our house and making it beautiful and adding value to it. Up to this point, we've just let them have their problems, because it's not like we have kids to worry about protecting, it's just my partner and I in our mid-twenties. Fast forward to last month. One evening, after it got dark, we heard what we thought were gunshots right in our backyard. Mind you, we live in a downtown suburb borough with an older person facility right behind our house, so we were a little concerned. We have cameras that we installed just to be safe, so we checked them. The grandson and his friends were sitting in their yard talking about shooting another round, they'll just think it's fireworks and that's a 45 round. Unfortunately, it was dark and we couldn't see them shoot it, but the camera picked up the sound of them shooting off 9 rounds, so naturally we called the cops. The kids then left and the cops couldn't prove anyone was on the premises with the gun so they let it go. In the beginning of August, the woman decided to let her daughter, sister-in-law, and their children move in with them for who knows what reason. Before this, they had only come to visit on holidays, and one time they left their infant child on the street in a carrier for over half an hour until I knocked and let them know that she was out there. None of my business. But from there on, the screaming and the yelling got worse, and this time with crying kids in the mix. I had half a mind to call CPS, but I've heard the awful things that happened to kids in the system, so I couldn't bring myself to do it. This month, we were fortunate enough to go on a road trip to see some cool places and visit family. We left at the end of August, and we were checking our cameras when we had service, which was not much. One day we get a call from our unattached neighbor saying that our attached neighbors were building a really ugly shed with spare planks from who knows where. We tried not to worry too much because up to this point their crappy shed wasn't our problem other than an eyesore in the neighborhood. We just enjoyed the rest of our trip and let it go, occasionally checking to make sure they weren't in our yard or anything since it's nicely fenced in and gated didn't catch anything on camera other than them building their crappy shed. 
We arrived home a few hours ago to find out those entitled jerks dug out and stole part of our fence, the metal post and chain link, to create a back fence and gate for their yard. This left huge holes in our back parking area that my partner almost tripped and fell into. They also tied into our fence incorrectly, pulling our fence lopsided and loose, basically damaging it. Unfortunately, our camera didn't catch them taking our fence, just it was in our yard in one frame, and in theirs the next. We want to press charges, but aren't sure how to go about it. We checked our seller's disclosure stating that the previous owners of our house had put the fence in, so we know it was our fence that they took. I'm so livid, and I know yelling at them won't fix it, but how can you be so entitled that you can't even buy your own chain link fence, but instead steal your neighbors when they aren't home? Call the police, file a report, and cut any fence tied into your fence post. We are planning to call the borough tomorrow and file a report with the police. We would do that last part, but considering the gunshot situation, the fact that we share a wall with them that doesn't have a firewall between us, and the fact that we know they are violent people who don't want to do anything that would cause them to be violent toward us. Thank you for the good advice though, it's very appreciated. Sometimes it's hard to think logically when you're seeing red. And then call your homeowner's insurance company as well. Very good idea and not something I thought of. See, so you gotta be careful in this situation. You don't wanna tick off the crazy neighbors, but you gotta do something to handle it. You could probably lawyer up in this situation. What do you think? What would you do? Thank you for your input, Karen. Or how I did exactly what the HR lady told me to do. Posted by Short Fine Whatever 67. The context. I, 35 year old female, live in a big city in Western Europe. After graduating college, I was hired as an office assistant in a big company. Let's call it Happy Place. I did my last internship as a student there, and it went so well that I got hired just a few weeks after getting my master's degree. Over the next 10 years, I worked my way up from an assistant to office manager to head of one of the biggest departments. I was not paid a lot of money, but it was above average and the benefits were great. But the main reason I stayed for so long was the people who worked there. Over the year, I've made quite a few friends there, and by the year 2020, I was one of the most experienced people working in Happy Place. My colleagues often came to me for advice about how to do this or that, and I also had a great relationship with the big bosses. And the cherry on top was that I had the best boss someone can hope for. Let's call her Maggie. Maggie was 10 years older than me, and she was Wonder Woman. She is nice, professional, cool, helpful, and has a heart of gold. I've worked with her during my whole time at Happy Place, and the last four years, she was my direct supervisor. I loved her. Then, in 2020, a few things happened almost at the same time, and over the course of six months, Happy Place turned into Sad Place. First, the company hired a new HR lady, Karen. She was the worst. She treated everyone below her level of responsibilities, which is pretty much 99% of the staff, as if they were lesser people, talked down to everyone, and constantly made changes in the HR policies. She implemented quite a few new rules, which led to us losing some of the benefits that we liked, like free lunches, paid time off to go to the doctor's office during office hours, and so on. But the CEO of the company trusted her for some reason, and soon he stopped taking meeting with the staff, making Karen the only person who could make decisions regarding the staff, which meant that no one could actually complain about her, and we slowly started feeling helpless. Second, Maggie was promoted to a different field, the one that she actually wanted to work in, so I can't be mad at her for leaving, and she got replaced by Susan as my new supervisor. Susan was cool, but she was my age and with less experience, which did not make much sense. So, even though on paper she was the one in charge, I was the one constantly explaining to her how things worked and what needed to be done while she took the credit. And lastly, pandemic. Our line of work was highly impacted by the pandemic, so the whole year of 2020, I was working under an enormous amount of stress, taking almost no vacation time, doing my job and some of Susan's job, as at some point she went on medical leave, and some of my co-workers' jobs, as some colleagues cracked under the tension and quit, but no one got hired to replace them. 
But despite all of the hard work, I did not receive any pandemic related bonus, which was weird since some of my coworkers let it slip that they got a thousand euro bonus for achievements during the pandemic. The compliance. So given all the events of 2020, in January 2021, I've decided that enough was enough. When it was my time for my annual review, I've decided that I would negotiate better conditions for myself because as much as I love my job and the people I've worked for, I couldn't keep working so much for so little pay. As Susan was still on medical leave, Karen was the one who did my annual review, despite the fact that I've only met her a few times and we've never directly worked together. In preparation for the meeting, I've made a list of the things that I've been putting up with and a list of reasons why I should get a slight pay bump. I was asking for a 15% pay increase, but was happy to accept a 10%. It was not about the money. It was about knowing that there was at least a chance that management valued me as an employee and that I was not just some sucker who did so much for not even a thank you. After making my case to Karen and carefully explaining to her what my job was and what I was actually doing, I asked her the dreaded question. She looked at me, smiled, and said, OP, I appreciate everything you've been doing for the company and we value you as an employee, but your responsibilities and your abilities are not worth that much. I was speechless. I admit I was so angry and hurt that I felt tears coming up to my eyes, but I took a deep breath, calmed myself, and said, thank you for your input, Karen, but I cannot keep working in these conditions. It's not worth it. Karen rolled her eyes and replied, then you can quit, but I will be sorry to see you go. And quit I did. You see, there were two things that Karen did not know. First, as explained, I was a highly valued employee with a great reputation and over 10 years of experience in the field. In our field, reputation is important. And for the last two years, I've been receiving job offers from competitors. I always refused because I love working for Happy Place. But since the events of 2020, I started taking interviews, checking what else was out there. And just before my meeting with Karen, I did an interview with Cool Company, who offered me a 60% raise to do the same job as I did for Happy Place. Second, remember how I said I took almost no vacation days in 2020? So by January of 2021, I had over two months of paid leave available. I checked with the HR, not Karen, the week before my annual review, and they confirmed to me, in writing, that I was free to take my vacation days whenever I wanted. So I did exactly what Karen told me to do. I quit. I put in my two months notice and took my two months vacation, which meant that I came to work for only one day to clean out my office and say goodbye before leaving for good. I felt bad because I left so many of my colleagues in a really bad position since they now had to do my job. But they all assured me that they understood and that they would have done the same thing. After my two months paid vacation, I started working at Cool Company and I've been here ever since. The Aftermath I kept in touch with a few friends from Happy Place and they regularly informed me of what was going on over there. It seems that me quitting was the push that many of my coworkers needed to also make their final leap and quit. As I said, the conditions went from great to bad since Karen took office. Also, the fact that I quit so abruptly got the attention of the CEO, as we had a good relationship. He asked Maggie, who was aware of the whole story with Karen, about it, and she told him the truth. About me not getting the pandemic bonus, about Karen speaking down to staff members, about her telling me to quit if I wanted to. Then, the CEO finally opened his eyes and launched an investigation into Karen's actions. He personally did interviews with some staff members and heard stories about her from people from many different departments. He also investigated the pandemic bonus story, and it turns out she only gave the pandemic bonus to her friends from different departments and a very generous one to herself. Plus, since I've quit, no one was actually able to do my job and the fact that Karen was responsible for me leaving made her responsible for the consequences. So, after reviewing everything, the CEO decided to terminate Karen's contract. Rumor has it that the whole staff of Happy Place celebrated this joyous occasion. The cherry on top. Last week, my boss at Cool Company walked into my office and said, OP, you know Jen from HR is retiring soon, right? 
We did interviews to replace her, and one of the candidates is Karen. She seems competent, but asks for quite a lot of money. You and her work together, right? What's she like? Do you think she deserves to be paid more than we initially offered? I said, Boss, you have a few minutes? Great, let me tell you a story. After hearing my very honest opinion of Karen, Boss Man laughed and said, Okay, good to know. I think we will tell her that she is not the right fit for us. Thanks, Austin. As soon as Boss Man left my office, I sent an email to my friend Lori from HR, who was in charge of replying to candidates. I also told her the story and asked her to keep me informed if there's any development with the whole Karen applies to cool company thing. A few hours later, I got an email from Lori. Turns out, she copied me to her official reply to Karen. It read, Dear Karen, Thank you for your interest in working for Cool Company. After careful consideration, we regret to inform you that in our opinion, your responsibilities and your abilities are not worth that much. I brought Lori a big chocolate cookie the next day. You want things done by the book? All right, let's do that. Posted by Anomalous Treasure. I work as a freelance artist doing advertisement, ticket, and program booklet designs for various police and firefighter events that give to children's charities. It's not consistent work, but it pays pretty well for what it is. The people I work with directly are a promotions company that was created to sell the advertisement space and tickets. I've been working for them for a long time. Throughout the pandemic, these people were essentially my only source of income, so I had to put up with their BS. Mostly having to put up with having to hear, the check is in the mail, for two or three months before it actually arrives. I convinced the owner of the company to download PayPal so I could be paid in a reasonable time. He was confused on how to use it. So I told him about Cash App. I was paid through Cash App only once before he said, I just want to keep doing this by the book. These websites you're sending me look too scammy. And because I don't work for him, I work for the unions and they're the ones cutting the checks. I asked him if he really wants to do that. Of course, he said yes. Cue malicious compliance. He's becoming quite upset with me since he realized doing it by the book actually gives me all the leverage. From that point forward, I had begun putting my logo watermark on every single thing I sent him. The first time he experienced this was with show tickets. He asked me to remove the watermark and send it to the printers. He was satisfied with the work. I told him the watermark will come off when there is money in my account. He told me that he can't start making sales until he has the tickets to sell, thus he doesn't have the money to pay me. Oh man, that sucks. Better figure out how to pay me electronically then. Here's my Bitcoin and Ethereum wallets, PayPal, and Cash App info, as well as info for direct deposit. He insisted that he couldn't pay me before he has the tickets, so he agreed to a 50% price increase for me to release the files to him without pay and with my company's logo on them. <laughs> I actually got paid for that today. The second time was with the show poster. The same instance occurred, only this time I was told I'd have to talk to the Fraternal Order of Police, FOP, about being paid since I work for them. They were very confused when I called them, and an hour later I got an angry phone call and was paid by direct deposit from the promoter's business account, not the Fraternal Order of Police account. This morning was pretty interesting. He called me up while meeting with the police association to talk about cutting me a check for the last show that happened yesterday. On this call, I was asked about bank transfers, asked how to make a Bitcoin wallet, all that good stuff. But the promoter asked why my invoice stated that I'm no longer accepting checks as a form of payment. Are you sure you want me to answer that in this meeting? I asked him. He said yes. So I told him while he was on speakerphone with his boss, but because you don't pay me for months when we do checks, I only accept online or bank transfers. There was a little back and forth between him and the guy from the police association. It didn't sound like Mr. Promoter was having a good time. I was told I would get a call back about payment. Well, I received that call from the police association, not the promotion agency. I've been paid via PayPal and apologized to profusely. When I got a call from the promoter afterward, he had a very upset tone. He asked why I'm doing all this. Well, sir, you told me you wanted it done by the book, right? This is by the book. We didn't do it by the book before because I've worked with you for years and your son is my best friend. So this is how it will be from now on. We'll see how it turns out. 
I'm confident I won't be losing any work since the police associations, firefighters, and other organizations have repeatedly told me how great my work looks and how I often work at half the price of other freelancers. Can't you just unload around me? Posted by Barbecue Lunch. So this happened earlier today and was too perfect to not share with you guys. I work in construction as the foreman for a new house build. The location is kind of strange. The house is 250 feet up a hill via a footpath only. All of our materials have to come up this footpath by hand. It's a pain in the butt to manually carry, quite literally, an entire house up this hill. One of our saving graces is having the two parking spots on the street at the bottom of this hill marked with an official no parking signs. Unfortunately, there is an elementary school about half a block away, and the parents of the children seem to regularly, at least twice a day, think it's okay to park in our spots. Now, I consider myself a reasonable person, so if someone is parked in the spots and we don't have a delivery or a need to park the truck, I'll let it go. If we need the spots and there's someone parked there, however, I will ask them to move nicely, and most of the time, they do so immediately. Until today. I get a phone call from the lumber delivery truck that is en route to our location. He says he'll be there in about two or three minutes. I let him know that I will meet him at the street and make sure he has space to park. He's carrying all of the material to frame the roof of our house, which is a lot of really big lumber, and will easily take an hour to bring up the hill. So naturally, I didn't want him parked in the middle of the street with his hazards on for an hour, when we have a perfectly good parking spot for him. As I began my trip down the hill, I noticed there is a school parent sitting in her car idling. Assuming she's just waiting to pick up her child, I walk to her car and politely let her know that she's parked in a no parking zone and we really need her to clear it to park a delivery truck. She scoffs at me and rudely states back, it'll be just a few minutes and your truck isn't here. Take a chill pill, dude. Before I can respond, a giant lumber truck comes around the corner and I wave to him and then gestured towards him to the woman in the car who has now put her window back up to ignore me. I put on my best customer service smile and wave at her through the window. She put it down halfway and angrily shouts, What? By now the truck has pulled up alongside her car and I politely ask her again with a stronger tone of voice to move her vehicle, reminding her that she is illegally parked in a tow-away zone. Then she gives me this wonderful idea. She says, can't you guys just unload around me? Jesus, not that hard. I give her another smile and walk away, a brilliant plan forming in my head. I instruct the delivery driver to park as closely to her as possible and block her in with the porta potty that is at one end of our reserve spots and the parked car that is parked just adjacent to our spots on the other end. He smiles because he immediately gets what I'm trying to do and proceeds to expertly block this lady and her car into a little two parking spot jail. We unstrap the lumber and my beguys begin humping material up the hill. Meanwhile, I call the police parking enforcement to let them know the situation. At this point in time, I wasn't trying to get her in trouble. I just wanted a record of why we were blocking part of the street so we don't get in trouble with the city. The very friendly traffic officer lets me know that she can be there in about 30 minutes and deal with the situation for me. Wonderful. As we continue to unload lumber, the child of the parent shows up and wouldn't you know it, mom is just now realizing that the lumber truck is parked so close that she can't get out of her driver door to meet her kid. She awkwardly clambers across the inside of her car and stumbles out the passenger door, shooting glaring looks at me and the truck driver in the process. She loads her kid into the back and then begins to realize that she has no way of leaving. She comes storming up to myself and the driver and states, I'm in a big hurry. You need to move your dang truck right now so I can go. Before I can respond, the driver gets a grin on his face and says, uh, Ma'am, in order to unload the lumber on the truck, we had to unstrap it. And per our company policy, I'm not allowed to move the truck with any unsecured load on it. Sorry. This sends her into near aneurysm levels of blood pressure. Meanwhile, I can barely contain my laughter. Screw your policy, I have somewhere to be, she barks back at him. At this point, with impeccably convenient timing, the parking enforcement officer shows up and parks behind the truck. She doesn't see the officer arrive, and while the officer is still getting out of her vehicle, I just casually say, can't you just pull out around it? It's not that hard. With the biggest crap-eating grin I've ever had as I watch as she realizes that I had just used her line on her. Screw you, she yells, and storms back to her car and angrily clambers back in through the passenger door and into the driver's seat. 
At this point, the officer is walking up to myself and the driver, and before she can even introduce herself, the mom in the car slams it into reverse, stomps on the gas, crashing into our porta potty and knocking it over, and then throws the car into drive and tries to mount the curb and drive on the sidewalk. The officer, driver, and I are staring in disbelief as she gets halfway over the curb and gets stuck. I can hear her screaming obscenities over the idling truck from inside the car. The officer promptly walks up to the door of her car and orders her out. My favorite part of the entire thing is watching her face go to shock as she realized she just did all of that in front of a police officer. She gets slapped in cuffs as the parking officer calls for a second unit and she is promptly sat on the very curb that she tried to drive over. She sits on the curb yelling to the now two officers about how we told her she could stay there and that we never asked for her to move. The traffic officer responds that she was the one who was originally called when she first refused to move and that she already knows what's going on. While myself and the driver are giving a report to the second officer, my guys finish moving the remainder of the lumber and the driver finishes his statement and takes off to go back to the yard. By the end of the ordeal, she was arrested, charged with child endangerment, which her kid was in the back of the car the whole time, reckless driving, destruction of property, the porta potty, and driving on a suspended license. On top of all that, she also got her car towed, the kid went home with his grandma, and she went to spend some quality time in a cell. I never expected her to actually heed my advice to just pull out around it, but I think next time she'll probably think twice about parking in a tow-away zone, if she ever gets a license again. Don't fire the guy who holds the patents. This is my father's story. He had a degree in mechanical engineering, either a master's or a doctorate. It had taken him many years to get, and he was very proud of that. Thanks to his training, he had found his way working for many well-known companies, working primarily with the procedures used to make various things. Over time, he had privately began working on an idea that would revolutionize how school and gym lockers worked. See, my father realized that there was a problem with those type of metal lockers. Namely, it was very easy for a person to break into them. What's more, as the lockers were designed, there were multiple moving exposed moving parts, which meant that if a student put too many books in one or really anything got against the door, the locker could be jammed shut, making it near impossible to open. So for several years, Dad toyed with a number of ideas before hitting on a new design which would solve all of those problems. The inner workings of those lockers locking mechanism would be contained within the door in such a way that one, it was impossible for someone to shim or break into, and two, the entire mechanism would be enclosed, and three, it was, well, relatively maintenance free. Now at this point, my father was the vice president of manufacturing, and apparently there wasn't a clause in this contract that said that if he designed anything while working for the company, then he had to turn that over to them for profit. Dad still approached the company, offering them the design, but they weren't interested. Dad sat on the design for a while before eventually just taking out several patents on them and then forgetting about them. About six months after his first attempt at getting the company interested, the parent company's owner and chairman of the board passed away, and the board opted to sell off some of the holdings. The company that my dad worked for was part of that. The new owners were young guys who seemed to think that they knew everything, as young business owners always seemed to think, and they set about changing 99% of the way things were being done. At some point, they stumbled across the plans that my father had designed. Now, that's where things turned curious. They really wanted to start producing this new design, but as they didn't have all the plans and processes laid out for them, they had to turn to my father for answers. Rather than asking him how to do it, or licensing the patents, as any reputable company would have done, they ordered him to turn over all of his work, or else they would fire him. Dad stood his ground and refused. The new owners and my father went back and forth, arguing over details for several weeks before finally the new owners fired my father for insubordination. So, 
on to the revenge. There may be more to this, but I'm not entirely sure if it's just pro-revenge. <laughs> it could border on nuclear based on what happened some years later. Though I'm not certain that what later happened had anything to do with my father's actions. So after cleaning out his office and packing things in the trunk of his car, my father headed home and made a few phone calls. He must have gone through eight or nine different calls before he got in touch with someone who was interested in what he had to say. See, my dad was under no illusions that the company had fired him wasn't going to just make those patented lockers on their own. He also knew that, though the company itself was relatively small, the owners had money and there was no way that he could fight them. However, a larger company could. So he contacted the major competitors and made them an offer. He eventually set up a meeting with some people, wheeled out the prototype that he'd made, explained how everything worked, and noted that with this system, the company could revolutionize the way that lockers were both designed and improve both safety and security. What's more, as he was the only patent holder for the next seven years or so, that company could be the only company to produce them. The competitor jumped at the chance and bought all the patents, both for the design and the process. They even paid my dad a substantial consultancy fee to go out to their manufacturing site and teach their crews how to make the needed tool and die sets to produce them. Less than six months after the first company had fired him, their number one competitor was completely destroying them in the market with this new design and there wasn't a dang thing the first company could do about it. They did try suing my father, claiming that he had stolen their intellectual property, but that case quickly evaporated when they had to admit under oath that they'd never actually signed a contract with him, and there was no requirement that he turn over anything he had created to the company. In the seven years from when the second company bought the locker design and the process patents, they pretty handily moved into markets that previously they'd been unable to. The first company soldiered on, but by the time the patent had finally expired, they were a shadow of their former selves. The new owners had sold the company at a loss, with the competitor buying it, only to shut that production facility down due to redundancy put maybe 200 people out of work, though given how they'd lost so much business, I wager it was far less than that. So yeah, the new guys don't want to play ball, threaten the guy that holds the patents on something that they want to do, and then fire him, only to have him take everything to their competitor and effectively put them out of business. I was asked that, you know, I don't know what the degree level was. Well, my father and I had a very difficult relationship. There are some very good few memories I have of him, and it wasn't until shortly before his death in 2007 from a stroke that I really started to connect with him. I resented him for most all of my life because he was more career-minded than anything. I figure we moved some 10 times in 20 years, and it greatly affected me. For a rather long period of time, I am ashamed to say I hated my father and wanted nothing to do with him. So I must have ended up wealthy, huh? Well, no, not really. Any money that dad earned off of his little endeavor was lost after an incident that left him disabled. Medical bills being what they are, by the end of it, we were pretty much broke. If you say that patents last 20 years, well, design patents don't. They last 14, but the courts have historically sided with companies infringing on design patents after 7 years, so long as the infringing company develops their own method to produce whatever design is being used and modifies or changes it. I can't tell you what company it was, but a variation of how the owners didn't know? That answer is pure speculation on my part. However, I got the impression that the owners were in their mid to late 20s and trying to act like investors. The company was on offer relatively cheap from what I know, but had a rather long history in the manufacturing field. This is a perfect case of, we're going to come in because we know everything and just completely gut out the company and without doing your due diligence and it comes back to bite you. What have you done if you were OP? Pro Army Revenge PAR is par for the course, posted by Sloppy Ice Cream. Dear Reader, I had an illustrious 21-year career in the United States Army, USA, which miraculously concluded with an honorable discharge. 
21 years and 14 combat deployments produce a lifetime of stories. The overwhelming majority of memories are comical and worth remembering, like the time I borrowed another human's truck or the time I relocated an artillery display in my barracks room. However, some memories are extra ammunition after a live fire exercise, LFX, worth donating to Chuck and Barry. Memories suppressed so well they never happened. However, these memories can be unintentionally triggered. I worked at the bad place before attending assessment and selection. Working there was the sole reason for attending selection. The bad place, TBP, was a three-star command and nursing home for dying careers. TBP was a mixture of National Guard, Army Reserve, active duty, and Department of Army civilians. It was essentially a foreign planet for a soldier who had grown up in regiment and the 82nd Airborne Division. Overnight, I had transitioned from airborne infantry to the equipment tracking officer. It was my sole purpose in life to source pre-deployment training equipment, or PDTE, for deploying National Guard and Army Reserve units. These units would request specific types of equipment, and it was my responsibility to source at least two-thirds of the requested equipment. I should mention, my boss at TBP was Department of the Army Civilian, DAC. I had 10 years of service under my belt, and it was the first time my direct supervisor was a civilian. Now, I have no issues with civilians, but I do have issues with horrible leadership. Mike was horrible. I mean, Mike was a dirty diaper full of crap and always on my butt. Side note, I say that I feel the need to mention TBP recently moved. And you say, moved? Yes. Deep South one day, and the Midwest the next. Aliens? Nope. Base Realignment and Closure, BRAC. Wait, what? The Army decided to close some bases and expand others. You reply with, oh, so uh, what's this have to do with the story? OP says, there was two active duty soldiers and two Department of the Army civilians performing the duties of equipment tracking officers in the Deep South. None of them moved, and all continuity was lost. You reply with, Okay, there had to be some kind of transition though, right? Yes, all four of them spent countless hours informing me how terrible a human Mike was via email. Oh, story time again. Dear reader, I had no earthly idea what my job was or how I was to perform it initially. Making matters worse, I would quickly learn that Mike had no earthly idea either. Mike only knew what Z, final product, looked like and was mentally unaware of the other 26 letters in the alphabet. Mike was less useful than a blinker fluid in football bats. Fear not, dear reader, it only took three months of working, from 5 o'clock to 2300 hours, to garner a nascent understanding of my roles and responsibilities. That's 11 p.m. Thankfully, I had wonderful counterparts at sister organizations. Furthermore, they were all equally aware of how useful Mike was. Fast forward four months. The section was still composed of exactly one sloppy, or me. I was 25% of the total allotted manpower, performing 100% of the duties. If you wait until the last minute, it only takes a minute, was my battle cry. Life was grand. I had developed standard operating procedures, or SOPs, and automated matrices to assist me. I was even starting to catch errors from the department that validates equipment requests. Do note, remember, it was my duty to source two-thirds of the equipment request. I had a very unpleasant one-way conversation in August of 2011. Captain Richard Cranium was requesting that I provide three Rhino buses for training. Dear reader, I kindly explained why fulfilling this request was unfeasible. Problem solved, right? <laughs> nope. I then received a call from Lieutenant Colonel Richard Cranium. I then received a call from Colonel Richard Cranium. The issue quickly became a self-licking ice cream cone of chaos. Ring, ring, ring. I say, the bad place, G4 equipment tracking officer, this is Rank Sloppy speaking. How may I help you, sir, ma'am? Caller says, this is Major General Richard Cranium from the California National Guard. Side note, 
civilian raiders, the Major General is the boss jerkhead for all National Guard soldiers in the state of California. Sloppy or me does not get calls from general officers, ever. Uh, how can I help you, sir? He angrily says, I am calling to inquire as to why you will not fulfill our equipment request. Is it not your policy to provide two thirds? Dear reader, I was now a bit agitated. I had clearly explained the issue to the company commander, battalion commander, and brigade commander. I now have an irate god level commander on the phone and two courses of action are cycling through my mind. I could kindly explain why this request was absurd or I could go full regiment sloppy. Slot machine sloppy. Pulls lever. Wheels are spinning and still spinning. Regiment sloppy. Uh, sir, I clearly explained to the previous commanders why I cannot fulfill their request and provided other options. I don't want options, rank sloppy. I want my three rhino buses. With my time to get fired attitude, I said, Roger, sir. Well, as I told the previous commanders, there are only five rhino buses that exist on Earth. Three of them are deployed to Iraq, and the other two are in Afghanistan. Do you wish for me to forward this equipment request to Forces Command, Four Star General? Cranium says, Oh, that won't be necessary, Rank Sloppy. I say, Are you sure, sir? <laughs> I mean, I can. No, did you explain all this to... I'll explain it to every single one of them, sir. He says, Disregard, I have some phone calls to make. Dear reader, the world was right again, <laughs> at least I thought it was. It appears that the Major General was slow to contact his subordinate leadership. The Colonel had contacted Mike demanding that I supply his unit with rhino buses. <laughs> one would think that a simple explanation would suffice for Mike, but one would be wrong. Common sense is an elusive, fickle creature for Mike. It was like trying to explain what number the letter purple tastes like. Mike says, did you tell a unit they can't have a piece of equipment? I say, yes, sir. Why? Well, because there are only five of them and they are deployed to combat zones. Well, you need to figure out how to get them. Ah, is this man freaking serious? My brain says, laughing, <laughs> I think he is. I reply, like, call the Pentagon and ask them to redeploy them from combat because some unit needs to train with them. Mike angrily replies, it's not your job to validate equipment. It's your job to source it. Do you understand? With my lip service, I reply, <laughs> Roger that, sir. Dear reader, when one door closes, check for an open window. I had over 90 units on my desk and 30,000 pieces of equipment to source for the month of August. It didn't take long to find a window to crawl out of. I found a unique request from an infantry unit. They requested a plethora of equipment and it all made sense. Minus four pieces of equipment. My brain said, huh, pretty sure those four pieces of equipment need to be on a uh, different type of request, right? Yeah, yeah, but it's not your job to validate it. Oh, right. Dear reader, I sourced it, all four of them. It was not an easy task either. I literally had to scour the entire country for available inventory. I made phone call after phone call to make this request happen. None of the items were collocated. They would need to be transported from the far stretches of the continental United States, and failure was not an option. I had fulfilled my responsibilities. I sourced the equipment and turned it over to Mike for signature. Mike's signature magically allocates funding and authorizes the transportation of said equipment. Dear reader, crap typically rolls downhill. However, this specific request defied the laws of gravity. Crap was gonna grow uphill. I crawled back through the window and waited a month for the fallout to ensue. Truth be told, due to my heavy workload, I'd forgotten about my magnificent accomplishment. It was another horrible day at work until I received a magical phone call. Ring, ring, ring. I say, uh, the bad place, G4 equipment tracking officer, this is Rank Sloppy speaking. How may I help you, sir or ma'am? Caller says, uh, Hello, I am Sergeant First Class Ricky Bobby. I am the Long Range Surveillance Platoon Sergeant for a unit name. Uh, hey Ricky, how can I help you? Well, I am looking at four helicopters and I am told I need to sign for them. Me, in yes mode, I say, uh, Let me look at your request. Shuffling noises ensue. 
Oh yes, uh, you requested two UH-60L Blackhawk helicopters and two UH-47 Chinook helicopters, correct? Yes, but I requested them for SPIES, which is Special Purpose Insertion Extraction System, and FRIES, Fast Rope Insertion Extraction System Training. <laughs> I'm not a pilot, what the heck am I supposed to do with four helicopters? I'm laughing back and say, I mean, once you sign for them, they're yours. I, I suppose you could try to like uh, fly them? Him laughing replies, <laughs> frickin' army, <laughs> suppose I could. Don't worry, man, I've got your back. <laughs> I've already coordinated with our aviation validators and they're gonna support your request. I'll give you their number. Ricky Bobby says, I'm ready to copy. It's a eight six seven five three zero nine. Ah, thanks, man. Call me back if you have any issues, brother. I'll walk upstairs to G3 operations and get this sorted so you boys can do spies and fries. We'll go, we'll comply, man. Dear reader, not only does crap roll uphill, but crap rolls uphill faster than I expected. I had just hung up the phone and was departing for lunch. I didn't make it five feet before I was beckoned to Mike's office. There are four chairs in Mike's office, one with a load-bearing capacity of at least 400 pounds and four normal people chairs. I was awkwardly surprised to find that it was already standing room only. The G4 Colonel, Deputy G4, and G3 Colonel were already in Mike's office. Mike says, it seems we have an issue, Rank Sloppy. My brain's like, uh, we? Uh, really, I'm not aware of any issues, sir. Well, unit name is at Fort Hood, and the battalion commander is wondering why one of his platoon sergeants signed for four helicopters? I reply, shocked. Did they request four helicopters? I can go get the equipment request. I have it right here in my hands. I'm puzzled. I'm like, okay, did they request? Yes, they did. I don't understand. The, the issue is, the G4 Colonel replies, we needlessly ship four helicopters across the United States. G3 Colonel chimes in. There are already helicopters at Fort Hood. Helicopters and pilots there to support spies and fries training. They are there specifically for this type of request. G4 Colonel says, Rank Sloppy, did this request not look uh, odd to you? My brain is laughing hysterically, but I actually say, oh, absolutely, sir. The entire room with shocked faces just baffled as heck. G4 says, then why did you source it? Then I go back and retell the entire Rhino Bus saga. Sir, as I understand it, it's not my job to validate, it's my job to source it. Mike made it very clear on multiple occasions. Mike angrily says, Rank Sloppy, do you realize that you just cost the army over $100,000 to ship equipment we didn't need to ship? Uh, sir, G3 chimes in, ticked off, no, Mike, you just cost the army over $100,000. Uh, sir, Mike, it is your signature that authorizes allocation of money and shipping. Did you tell Rank Sloppy it's his job to source, to not validate anything and just, just only source? Sir, I did, but G4 Colonel starts walking out. Mike, let's have a meeting in my office. My brain thinks, oh, that sounds bad. But, but yeah, Mike, not us. And I say, right, and then retreat to my desk. Side note, I know the G3 Colonel. We had worked in the same unit when he was a major. He follows me and sits on my desk, laughing hysterically, says, <laughs> How in the heck did you do it? I'm like, do what? Find four, four helicopters. I called everyone. I leveraged my network of contacts and made it my mission. What did your counterpart say about the request? Uh, they have the same sentiments towards Mike. G3 shaking his head. Honestly, <laughs> that's impressive. Sir, I was going to get crap on either way, so I decided, screw Mike. G3 replies, yup, screw Mike, I guess. Dear reader, thank you for reading and listening to my petty army revenge. I have good news. I no longer worked for Mike after that interaction. Other misdeeds stories came to light after that encounter. I had a long desk side meeting with the G4 colonel and fully detailed my relationship with Mike. It's nearly impossible to fire department of the army civilians, but it was easy to move me. The G3 colonel found a more suitable position for an infantryman. 
it also sucked, but he gave me ample time to prepare for assessment and selection. I was at TBP for 18 horrible months before I found greener pastures. I could lament on all the horrible things, but it's not worth it. Why? <laughs> at least I know where to go if I ever need four freaking helicopters. Cheers, sloppy. Stiff me on overtime? Cue the long, expensive revenge. Posted by Deleted. This happened in the early 2000s when I joined a startup. We agreed on a salary and no paid overtime and an evaluation in three months and then annually. Standard stuff, mostly. It was a very mediocre salary for the work, but I really liked the work itself, which was extremely interesting and challenging. For me, even if the finances were so-so, I felt I'd learn a lot of skills which would be useful in the future. After three years of having 10 decent clients and a bunch of clients trialing and money rolling in, the talk turned to back pay and paid overtime, plus compensating for past overtime. At that point, around $50,000 in overtime had been accrued, which is a lot. Legally, it couldn't be back pay, so the talk was always of a discretionary bonus. Now, at this point, everyone is okay with this, myself included, and this was discussed in writing via the company emails too, so I felt secure and that no bad will was in play. I felt the company should be able to afford the payment, and equally, I'd happily settle for equity at a discount, which is legally possible there, if cash flow was an issue. The discussions about back pay, possible equity, and now started to drag on, and I was getting irked by this. In the end, I was made an offer of equity, which meant the company valuation was far beyond anything reasonable, in the hundreds of millions, and I'd get a minuscule stake, less than 0.01%, of a company with 9 employees and a projected annual turnover of around 2 million. It was a FU of sorts to stiff me out of my money, and I didn't want to take that lying down. To say I was furious was an understatement. Anyway, the day he made that offer, I handed in my resignation. This sent the CTO into panic mode because the CEO had refused an updated contract and I was still on a one month notice period. Plus, I had a lot of untaken paid leave. Basically, it meant that I was walking out right then and there. So, off I went that very same day, to the shock and surprise of everyone, I guess. The next day, I sent an official registered letter requesting my overtime and back pay and received a negative response, which I followed up with another detailed demand. This was also rejected because the bonus was discretionary and, quote, there is no overtime. However, I'd been seeking legal advice and I understood that they don't have a leg to stand on if I am willing to pay for an attorney. As the liability in such matters is firmly and 100% on the employer, I was willing. Now you need to understand that going to a lawyer was very rare in those parts back then, so companies didn't generally expect this outcome, and things have since changed. Now when going through the applicable laws with the attorney, I noticed there is a limitation of 7 years. So while my attorney was laying out what to do in order to get me my money in a little as a few weeks, I just asked him what if we wait until it's 6 years and 11 months after the transgression and then file demanding interest. I wanted this because the law stated that back pay is due at a 9% APR above the base rate, which was 3.25% at the time. It's accrued daily for every day past the due date. We're looking at around 12 to 12.5% compound daily APR. The risk is that the company folds in that time, but I decided to take that risk. I sent one final letter stating that I expect, and I quote, all the owed and accrued amounts to date, end quote, to be paid immediately. <laughs> and of course, nothing happened. For the next few years, life rolled on. The company did grow and become a known player in the area. When the time came, I found an attorney and started the case. We had copies of all the communications, copies of the registered letters and responses. The back pay demanded now, including interest, was $112,000. What I didn't know was that in addition to this, that there are fixed penalties for each instruction to perform uncompensated overtime. The total demand was something like $135,000. To say that the CEO, who was still the CEO, lost his crap would be an understatement. I got a very verbally abusive phone call, which I dutifully recorded as it wasn't completely unexpected, and was added to the filing. The CEO fought, or tried to, but when the judge heard the phone call, he took an immediate dim view. Reading through all the communication just put more nails in the defense's coffin. 
the judge just ruled and instructed the company to pay immediately and without delay, and also ordered the company to pay all my legal costs. They also got a full audit from the Department of Labor. The company paid up a week later. To add insult to injury, the evening of the court's decision, the CEO apparently got very drunk and crashed his car into another vehicle while drunk. He got a DUI conviction and lost his driving license for half a year, and his insurance refused to pay out for the damages to his vehicle, which is a brand new Mercedes S-Class, as he was drunk. All in all, a glorious day. Terrorize my family, enjoy losing everything and going back to jail. Posted by RaditzFan9000. Myself and my wife had just had our second child and moved into a duplex in an amazing neighborhood, had its own playground even. We moved in and greeted the neighbors, bunch of younger people, but they seemed okay. The first day after moving in, we find that they're gone and they've left their seven-year-old on a school day outside of our door with a bag of goldfish and a note asking us to watch him while they went out. QCPS call number one. The neighbors and me got along really well. The old guy next door repaired bikes for a hobby and the next door neighbor did woodworking and would always come over to see the kids and send his grandkids over to play too. They warned us that our upstairs neighbors were trouble, constant traffic going in and out, and parties every single night. This was 110% the truth. It got to the point we couldn't sleep at night, and we had multiple altercations to the point that it was full-blown yelling matches. The landlord was useless, and he would do nothing to get rid of them, so I bided my time, and eventually, one night they came home in their red Mazda 3, and it was destroyed. They must have hit someone and ran. So, I called the RCMP to let them know, at least at the very least, I figured they'd get in deep crap, but, oh man, I had no idea what had just unleashed. Turns out the D-bag had a warrant out for his arrest for drug trafficking, he got hauled away in cuffs that night, and there's Entitled Woman 2 got a visit from CPS again, as they left their son home alone again, and this wasn't once or twice, it was every single day. So, my wife went digging for names and found the mother on Facebook. Using public record searches, we found out that they owed easy their home nearly 48k in assets as they'd taken off from the original address with all their furniture, including TVs and a huge sound system. 48 hours later, the sheriff was there with a the box truck emptying their house. Took the beds, couches, TVs, the annoying subwoofer system, kitchen set, and even the dressers. CPS came shortly after and removed the child from the house. No, no, look, I didn't enjoy seeing him taken away, but they never fed him and he was always in the same clothing and it was falling apart. I mean, we even went out of our way to make sure that he had full meals when we couldn't let this kid starve. The D-bag went to jail for drug possession. He was out on bail and he hid the drugs in a dresser they took. Entitled Woman 1 went to jail for assaulting the sheriff and Entitled Woman 2 actually had a happy ending. As far as I know, after she lost her son, she went through multiple programs to clean herself up and started working to provide for her son. I ran into her a couple years ago and she thanked me for what I did. I got pro revenge on the drug dealer and his girlfriend and thankfully helped someone get on the right path. I'll come back so long as Larry isn't there, posted by Reddit Admin Dumb 87 To give you some background on my friend Tim, made up name, he's been programming since he was like 7 years old. Tim said by the time that he got to college, he breezed through most of his comp sci classes because a lot of the content they were covering he'd already mastered years prior. Tim is an excellent programmer. Tim's career has been quite successful. He's worked for Google, Facebook, Amazon, and finally a hedge fund. The story starts at the hedge fund. Tim works with a lot of AI technology, and at this hedge fund, he was the lead programmer manager who spearheaded an effort to optimize their AI that helped them complete literally millions of trades a day. To say his work had a massive impact was an understatement. All of this going on with COVID-19 in the background, and due to the pandemic, they went to a work from home model where my friend Tim kept working. During the work from home, Tim was looking around his fancy $4,500 NYC apartment and wished for things like a yard, heated pool, a nice three-car garage, and not living in a high-rise. It dawned on Tim that he could leave New York City. Tim moves to Michigan. So Tim moved back to his hometown in Michigan, where he bought himself a really nice home with a heated pool, a three-car garage, a nice yard, and guess what the yard had in it? 
a mother-in-love suite, which was essentially a two-bedroom, one-bath second home on the property of his main home, which he turned into his man cave. It's actually pretty sick. Oh yeah, and his mortgage payment was far less than his $4,500 month rent, like half. Tim spent the rest of his pandemic work from home pounding out projects and so on. He never actually informed his employer on an official basis that he'd moved. He just kept working. Then the pandemic ended. The pandemic is finally over. Back to the office, or... Tim's boss, Larry, calls him up and goes, All right, Tim, on Monday we're starting work back at the office. And Tim goes, uh, Yeah, about that. I moved to Michigan. Larry is shocked and goes, You didn't even ask if you could do that? And Tim basically said, well, I didn't know I needed your permission to move in a sarcastic as heck way. Larry insists that Tim needs to move back to NYC or he won't have a place on the team. Tim says he's been doing the exact same work from home at a high level for the past year. He's willing to travel to New York City for a few meetings a year on his own dime, but he feels that his quality of life is so much higher outside of New York City and he has no desire to live in NYC. To which Larry said, if Tim doesn't have any desire to live in NYC, then he has no desire to keep Tim employed. Now, dear Reddit, what do you think a talented senior programmer with over a decade of experience who specializes in AI technology is going to say to a response like that? If you're thinking that he quit, you'd be absolutely right he quit. Maintaining complex code can be hard. Now, anyone that has done any programming knows that sometimes the best person to maintain that code is the person who wrote the code. There's logic, there's thought processes, there's just so much that goes into programming that can be so individualistic that it can be hard for someone to take over a code base that they didn't write. John, CEO, enters the picture. Six weeks goes by when John calls Tim. John is the CEO of the hedge fund. John gets Tim to agree to consider coming back, so that's when John suggests that they fly Tim to NYC and he sits down with John. Tim, however, flipped the switch and said, uh, no, how about you fly out to Michigan and we discuss this? Tim said that he said that because he wanted to establish that if he was going to come back, it was going to be him working from Michigan. And, and if he was going to talk to his employment, it was going to be done in Michigan. John agreed and two days later flew out to meet with Tim. So Tim sits down and John says that they really need him because he provided a lot of value to the organization and the programming team, they're struggling. John offers Tim the opportunity to come back with a 20% pay cut since he won't be living in NYC and John called that a cost of living adjustment. To which Tim said, no, I want a 15% raise above what I was earning. John sits back and responds, the reason we pay what we pay is because we ask you to live in New York City, and we understand that's an expensive city to live in. To which Tim says, hey, you pay what you pay, and you pay it because I'm worth it. If I wasn't worth paying what you pay, you wouldn't be paying me. Now, my first condition is, if you want me back, it will be a 15% raise. John goes, and second? The second condition is, I'll come back so long as Larry isn't there. John sighs, oh, you're asking for too much. To which Tim goes, you don't need to bring me back if you don't want to, I'll be fine elsewhere. John goes, I'll talk to the partners. And Tim says, my offer is good till Friday. John goes, oh, what do you mean? And Tim says, next Monday is when I'm going to start looking for work. This offer is good until Friday. And it was Tuesday. And then John leaves. That Thursday, the phone rings and it's John. In conclusion, uh, Tim, we are transferring Larry to a different fund. He won't be working with you anymore, and we're fine with giving you a 15% raise. Can we send you an offer letter for you to sign? Tim says, of course, and Larry is really gone? John goes, yes, you'll never need to interact with Larry ever again. That was at the start of this year. Tim hasn't been in New York City, hasn't heard from Larry, and hasn't seen Larry on any communications and so on. Two for the price of one, posted by Golthing Dan. So I was laid off. No big deal, right? It happens. But in this instance, it's a little different. I was working at a tech startup and was one of the early employees. I was one of the key people to develop their technology, which significantly helped them enable to raise tens of millions of dollars. 
I was told early on that they would basically take care of me as the company grew. Well, for a time at least, the company grew leaps and bounds, again, much in part to the excellent tech I helped develop. Yet the company had little concern for little old me. Meanwhile, they brought on a bevy of new managers and high-level people, and yet my career was basically stagnant while I was there. But then, things started to slow down due to economic conditions. There had been a couple of layoffs, and I figured it was probably time to leave the sinking ship. So, I lined up a new position at another company. I then went into my manager and told him that it seemed like more layoffs were imminent and that I had secured a job offer at another company. I asked him if it would be a good idea if I should take it, and he said that he would let me know. A couple of days later, after he had discussed things with our CEO, they said I was okay and not to take the other position. I turned down the other position because I had invested so much of myself into this company, even having sold my house and moved hundreds of miles to work at this company. And I still had a lot of stock options that I was hoping would be worth something someday. Literally a couple of weeks later, guess what? Yep, yeah, they laid me off. Now that other position was no longer available, and because this was at the height of the recession, I was out of work for four months until I found another position. I could have even lost my house during this time, and I had to sell some cool stuff to keep paying the bills. The new position I finally found was much further from home and was a financial hardship. I would have been better off if they had just been honest with me and told me to take the offer I had had in hand previously. But honesty wasn't ever their policy. Anyhow, before I was involuntarily separated from the company, I was working with a Fortune 500 company that was trying to partner with us on some technology. After leaving, I got wind that they were going to invest $15 million in the company. That bothered me for several reasons, mostly because most of us were pretty sure that the crooked CEO was pilfering the company for personal gain. I'm thinking that this guy shouldn't be rewarded for his atrocious management of the company, and honestly, I didn't think that it would be a wise investment for this large company. I contacted my inside guy at the Fortune 500 and told him some of my concerns about the stewardship of the money at the startup and that it wasn't really a wise investment. This company was looking for a distribution deal for our technology, so I told them the best use of their money would be to make a deal to exchange a large blanket purchase order for stock. This way, the startup company would still get a big chunk of investment money coming in, but they would have to perform for it. It's the difference between giving a kid an allowance for no reason at all, or giving a kid an allowance based on if they did their chores or not. I didn't necessarily want the investors to walk away from a partnership because I had many friends still at the company and didn't want to see them out in the cold. So my thought was that this was a type of deal that would keep the company afloat while minimizing the potential for pilfering and better protecting the investment. All in all, if structured right, it could be a win-win and make it much more difficult for the crooked CEO and his cronies to loot the company. I additionally told them that I wouldn't recommend investing a penny unless they got a seat on the board of directors. That way, they would have first-hand knowledge of some of the shenanigans going on behind the scenes with their money. That was about it. Now they were armed with some additional information and tactics to perhaps better protect their investment as well as help ensure that if they did invest, everything would be above board. Sometime later, I heard that the CEO pulled the entire company into the conference room and chewed them a new one. He was furious because the investor had somewhat done what I suggested. They had dropped their investment from $15 million to $5 million and had come up with some sort of blanket order or something along those lines. I'm not quite sure, but in essence, it meant a $10 million loss in the mind of the CEO. He's a bit of a fat slob, so it's quite unfortunate that he didn't just have a heart attack right then and there. Not surprising, in the process, the investor was denied the board seat, and one can only guess why, dirty secrets and all. In fact, one of the board members that the CEO did bring on the board had already done time for defrauding his clients. A <laughs> marriage made in heaven, I guess. So, not necessarily meant as a revenge, but sweet nonetheless. The company basically lost $10 million because of what they did to me. They were all but expecting this money. Had they not laid me off, I probably wouldn't have even thought about putting the investor's interest above that of the corrupt company. In the end, surprising to no one, the investor eventually got majorly screwed by the unsculpturalist startup company anyways. 
The two companies had some disagreements about their distribution agreement, and the investor ended up having to pay a major settlement to the startup company after a contentious mediation. But never fear, don't screw with the Fortune 500. As the startup company was starting to gasp its last breath, they were working on a promising deal with another company they had identified as a major potential customer, one that would put them back on the track to financial success and further line the CEO's dirty pockets. Well, the Fortune 500 company got wind of this deal, bought the other company, and then shut down the deal. That's ninja-level revenge. So, in the end, two nuclear revenges for the price of one. I couldn't have been happier to hear about the karmic justice once again hitting the company. Now, the company is all but dead. All physical assets went to auction. The CEO is milking the last few dollars out of the account, but because our SEC, or Securities Exchange Commission, is all but worthless, he'll start another venture and the cycle will repeat itself. The sad thing is that the CEO, in my humble opinion, makes Elizabeth Holmes, the CEO of Theranos, look like Mother Teresa. I pray that one day they do a Netflix docuseries exposing all that went on at the mess of a company. I can guarantee you it will be quite a hit. Buy my program when you fire me? No? Okay. I was employed at a rather large factory, which is one of the largest plant-based companies in the world recently bought by an investment firm not so long ago. Anyways, I developed a program which was used at the factory. It could tell whenever any machines were not running, even if it was due to a manual stop or anything else. My program knew the reason why the machine was idling. This program made it so much easier for the entire factory. Workers were happy because they didn't need to do any manual work and write down every time the machine stopped lead up to about a year ago. The factory appoints a new chief. All the old employees that were in a leader position were let go because it was time for, quote, new blood to come in, end quote. There was a lot of talk about selling off parts of the factory, including machines and so on. This included programs that I had developed, including the program that identified whenever a machine stopped. I developed this program on my spare time. I showed it to the old management and they liked it enough that they wanted to use it on every station in the factory. Every machine was to use this program and all that had to be done was for the program to be maintained weekly. This was around five years ago or so. When the newly appointed factory chief wanted to let the old employees, me included, leave, it was not known that I was the person behind that program. Anyways, at my meeting with HR and the factory chief, I said that I was willing to sell them the program and teach someone how to maintain the program. The factory chief laughed in my face and said that it was company property and that it was simply their program and not mine. I offered to show them the source code and everything, but it led up to the point to where if I was to tamper with the program before my departure, they would sue me. I was officially let go Two month countdown began and after two months I was free. After a week or so, they noticed problems with the program. It would stop loading, stop registering stops, and it would mislabel stops. I knew that this was when the fun was about to begin. After about a month, I was called into the office and was told that I had tampered with the program because it had suddenly stopped working. I let them know that someone had to maintain it. I was ordered to teach someone how to do that job, and I told them, well, after you pay me for the program rights, they wouldn't budge, and I was told to return to work. When I had a week left, I strolled around the factory floor for a while and noticed that no stations were running my program anymore. I asked some operators why that was, and they told me, it just stopped working. Now we need to fill out forms every time the machine stops manually. I shrugged and told them to thank the factory chief. I left after that week. I got a phone call about a month after I left where they begged me to sell them the rights and teach someone how to maintain it. I never sold them that program. Instead, I sold an improved version to another factory nearby where I am now employed. 
Now I see some people say that I'm in the wrong based on US law. Just editing here to let you know that this didn't take place in the US. I made the program during my spare time at home, on my own computer. After introducing the program to the former factory chief, I was allowed to try it out on one machine and test it. The maintenance was done on my office computer. And after a few months, I was allowed to roll it out for the entire factory. It wasn't done overnight, there was lots of debugging to do. I have not heard anything from the company for nearly a year, so it would be weird for them to just suddenly come after me now. Just wanted to make that clear. That sounds like a classic case of, we're the company and we're going to do it right. Oh, we need to listen to the people that work there on the ground floor. Have you ever seen this happen? Let me know. Fire me for speaking up. Enjoy going out of business. Posted by LOL What Mufflers. Many years ago, I worked at an automotive repair shop that was owned by a very nasty person. This person actually had two shops that he ran, and the best way I can describe him was as a tyrant. Both shops had cameras, and he would watch us work from the comfort of his home. If he saw something he didn't like, such as taking a five minute smoke break, or not sweeping for a half a minute during downtime, or if he just wanted to bust balls, he would call the shop and harass us. Or better yet, at times, show up and harass us in person. In addition, he would regularly berate us for no reason, threaten to not pay us because the shops weren't busy, and would have an absolute meltdown if you dared question his authority. It was spectacular in the worst of ways. After working with him for a few months, and dealing with his shenanigans, and getting sick of pointless arguments with him, I started reconsidering my employment there. Around the same time, the owner decided to move me from one shop to the other, really for no reason other than likely to try to push me out as that was what he did with the few people that I had already worked with. Odd coincidence being that I had not discussed my thoughts of leaving with anyone, but I digress. I genuinely disliked the idea of working at this other shop. It was older and a bit run down, plus it was in a pretty terrible area with high crime but I wanted to line something up elsewhere before I jumped ship, so I made the move. This is where the beginning of the end started for old Mr. Owner. Once I got settled into the new shop, I got to talking with my fellow technicians. As it turned out, the owner was unsurprisingly an anti-race scumbag, and every single one of the employees at this location, aside from me, was African American. I'll spare you the details, but let's just say it's a miracle that the owner came into the shop, said what he said, and walked out breathing. In addition, he would regularly send people home with no pay for the day just to be a butt. This went on for a few weeks, him coming by, being nasty to all of us, and I was over it. And I was just about to leave as I had lined up other employment. The other techs were also over it. I went to give the owner my two week notice via phone, discreetly which I should have known wasn't a great idea. And instead of discussing it like a human, he decided to come down and talk face to face. Well, our friend was so incensed that I put my notice in that he forced me to clock out and go home and also forced two other techs who decided to stand up for me to do the same. I decided that I had enough of this guy's crap and that not only did he deserve to have some kind of reciprocation against him, but the other techs deserved better than to continually be walked on. So I filed a complaint with the Department of Labor and outlined everything. Within a few days, they launched an investigation. And of course, the owner found out who filed the complaint and called the shop and gave me heck about it, stupidly, because the phones he had were on recorded lines. Guess who I had request to listen to that conversation? In the end, I was terminated by him prior to my two weeks being up, as were the two techs who stood behind me. I filed for unemployment, which he fought me on by filing appeals with the judge, then not showing up three times in a row. This prompted the judge to bar him from requesting appeals against me and granting me full unemployment pay. Months later, I got a written letter from him extending an apology and offer to work for him again. Two months later, I got a letter from the DOL, Department of Labor, saying that the investigation was closed and that he had been found guilty of multiple charges and was barred from operating a shop or any other business in the state for several years. Fire me from my job with no notice? I'll ruin your entire company. Posted by Acrobatic Ad 2952. So start of December, I was let go of my job because they didn't have the time to train me for the job role. I needed to take out a loan to survive as it took me three weeks to find something new. 
I was hired for customer service administrator role, and as I'd never done that type of work, I was told that I'd be given full training on the job. The girls in the office never bothered, and I simply learned the job myself. I was told my performance was more than they expected, but suddenly, I was called in the office at 8.30 a.m. when I arrived and told they were really sorry, but they didn't have the time to train me so I would be let go immediately with no warning or notice, and I was completely shocked by this. To add, my contract stated that I was to be given 28 days notice of termination. The company I worked for uses government grants as a form of payment so they would regularly claim that they had done certain things they haven't to make more profits from the government, such as forging signatures and lying about what work they've done to gain more funding. Basically, we get funding from the government for providing services to lower income customers, that's all I can say. I was involved in a different department but shared an office with the department responsible for lying about profits. It's a small company and the director would constantly hassle them to forge signatures as we can get the jobs through quicker and if we had an audit, he would go to prison for what was being done. So when I got laid off, not by a manager, but someone who worked same level in my department, I was absolutely livid that they dragged me in a 60 to 80 minute drive for me to leave two minutes later. I got home and immediately called the fraud whistleblower helpline. Nothing came of this until a week later when they wanted more details. The thing is, I'm very good at being silent and taking in my surroundings. I was able to tell them which accounts had been forged and lied about. I also had considerable email evidence of what had been going on. So, long story short, majority have lost their jobs, including the people who couldn't be bothered to train me and went running to the director to fire me, including the director who is now being investigated for fraud and facing time in prison and a massive fine. Always live by the mantra, mess around and find out. So, you want us to adhere to the company hierarchy? Sure, posted by Zokoman. So I work as a mechanic in a sewage treatment plant and it's a very laid back job. In fact, three out of eight hours was spent not working. I know it sounds like we were just a bunch of freeloaders, but it's because the tasks we perform are simple and we do our best to do them ASAP. Anyway, the hierarchy in our plant is quite complicated, but the most important thing is that as a part of a mechanical department, our only supervisor on site is our master. At least I think that's the English translation. And both plant manager and plant master are not our supervisors, yet they, as well as other workers, asked us to carry out some jobs for them, which we gladly agreed to do, even despite most of them being out of our range of duty. You know, welding racks back together, installing a new faucet, and so on. Most of the time, we weren't doing anything else anyway, but sometimes we were preoccupied with our own tasks. Still, the plant master always told us that his tasks were more important and to just leave what we were doing for some other day. Due to this, many of our old tasks were left for another day, which because of constant request were left sitting for months. Still, it was always his jobs that had the priority. Now is the right time to address the tense situation we had with the plant master. He's best buddies with the manager, usually blaming all the shortcoming of his team on us. Stuff like something not being cleaned, sick, stuff that's not mechanical failure, stuff that's simply not important enough, or stuff that's beyond our competencies and should be taken care of by a specialist company. He also had this very annoying habit of rummaging through our tools, taking parts and using our machinery without asking. It's very annoying, but whatever, it's important to keep a good relationship and work. But then he dropped the bomb. He had the list of all our old tasks that were left unfinished. The list wasn't that long, by the way, about eight things, three of which were outside of our competencies, and said that the manager and CEO will be waiting in the conference room to give us a lecture and to take away our bonuses. The meeting went very roughly. It started with the CEO saying, you can say goodbye to your bonus this month, and then proceeded to give us a lecture about the importance of our tasks. Then, he kept blabbering about us, threatening our master, the plant master, being the only supposed witness, and so on and so on. When the CEO was talking about possible solutions, the plant master did the worst calculation of his life. He proposed adhering to the company's structure and proper workflow. Well, 
we didn't want to oppose since we knew what that means. We talked this over with our master, and now every time the plant manager and master want something to be done, we reply with, we don't take jobs in the corridors. We have our jobs to do, sorry. We can't afford to leave what we're doing. We have a plan for today. Or, does our master know about this? We cannot do anything without him ordering it to be done. By now, no one has been to our workshop for four weeks. No extra jobs. No side jobs. Nothing. Only two tasks a day that usually take 30 minutes each with a team of five. And it's all by the book. We definitely respect the company's structure and have a proper workflow focusing on our tasks. And by the way, most of the backlogs were also due to stuff breaking down, which is mostly due to a faulty infrastructure. Most of the pipes are clogged with sedimentation from PIX, PAX, which are coagulants, and require thorough cleaning and rebuilding. But I guess it's cheaper to simply replace a pump which had to push the same amount of sewage through pipes that have been narrowed by two times at this point. Those poor pumps. And yeah, the pipework and technology is the responsibility of the plant master and plant manager. <laughs>